Very special thanks once again to Affordable Prestige Cars. They're based, of course, in Glastonbury and have featured their vehicles a number of times on the channel, of course. Mostly Jaguars, but some Bentleys, some Rolls-Royce models are there as well, some Mercs, some Porsches even. So if you're in the market for something like that, a prestige or luxury vehicle, which is on the more affordable end of the used spectrum, then check them out. As I said, of course, they are based in Glastonbury, but if you want to check out their current inventory, click the link down in the video description and you can see what they've got for sale. The Jaguar XJ has actually been on my radar for quite some time. In particular, the XJR, the high-performance form of this generation, and incidentally, this one is an X350-shaped car, and even though I might reference the XJR a couple of times in terms of technical spec, I'm not going to get too much into that car because I do hope to review that one in its own video in future. For now, this is more of, you could say, an overview of the XJ of this generation, and more specifically, the XJ8 Sport, which is what this one is. Now, as I said, it is an X350 shape. This car ran from about 2004 to 2010. It had a facelift around 2007, which technically made it become the X351 model. And this one in particular is a 2005 car. Now, in terms of its engine, it's basically a baby version of that XJR's 4.2 litre supercharged V8. This one has a shorter stroke. It's a three and a half litre in capacity. Still a V8, interestingly, not a six cylinder, which is more what you'd expect from that kind of capacity. Typically, no supercharger, which isn't too surprising. It is a sport model, so it has decent specs. About 260 horsepower, 250 pound feet, so it's not crazy, but it's good enough to give the car a top speed of 150 miles an hour and a much more modest 0 to 60 time in comparison to that top speed of 7.3 seconds. So with those specs making it pretty clear that the main aim of this car is not sheer outright performance, let's put that to one side now that we've discussed it and talk about the rest of the car. What is this vehicle actually like? Because on the surface of things, it seems like a whole lot of spec for the money. It seems like a potentially really good deal. You can pick these up for like four or five grand, sometimes even for the R model with higher mileage. This one, for example, is 3995, which sounds crazy for something like this. So what do you actually get for the money, and are there dangers tied into that? Because usually if something's cheaper, there tends to be a reason. Of course, my own experiences with Maserati could have a bearing on this discussion, so let's get into it. First of all, let's talk first impressions. As soon as I started driving this car, I immediately liked it, and there were so many reasons why. I love the look of the interior for a start. The headroom is incredible in this car, and the crazy thing about it is, to me, this actually looks in some ways smaller than the 90s XJ did. The XJ from the 90s looks really long, really wide, kind of squat in terms of its height, almost like a supercar stance. This one to me looks kind of narrower and taller. It's not though, it's longer, wider, taller, and just bigger overall, including trunk space, than that previous 90s vehicle, so that's good to know. There was even a long wheelbase version, which is even bigger again. The headroom, though, really is the thing that impressed me the most as soon as I sat in the car, because spoiler alert for another review which is going to come up on the channel very soon, I drove not only this XJ, but also the newer one, the totally different looking 2010 shape in its portfolio form, and as I said, that one will be coming up on the channel soon. Now, those two cars are very, very different. You could argue even more different than this was to the 90s car. This one for me though, spoiler alert, is the sweet spot. I actually like this more than the newer car and there are a number of reasons why. Now, of course, the newer car will have a number of advantages, and we'll talk about some of those in that review. For now, though, the things that I loved more about this one were the headroom, for a start, which really surprised me in terms of being better than the new car, because the new XJ is a very large-looking machine. This one, to me, doesn't look as big as it actually is inside. It's kind of like a, a TARDIS in that respect, but the headroom, as I said, is fantastic. The width room, the leg room, it's all great. Another interesting personal take that I have on this particular generation of XJ, which incidentally is my favorite incarnation of the Jag XJ overall, this you know 2004 to 2010 era, in particular the pre-facelift up to 2006, 
is that the interior to me suits this car, this era of Jaguar style with the, the big puffy leather and the chunky steering wheel and the huge oval wood dashboard, that kind of thing. To me, it suits this car far much more than it suits the XK. Now, I'm yet to review one of those earlier 2000s or even 90s XKs, the really rounded ones. I hear great things about them, and I am looking forward to driving one, but I've never been a fan of the look of those. They just look a little bit too soft and rounded for my liking, which is one of the reasons why I love mine even more, the X150 shape. This interior, though, really suits the car. As I said, in my opinion, more than it would a sports car like an XK. That huge flat dashboard is very old fashioned. If you think about it, most modern cars have a dashboard that tends to sweep away from you towards the bonnet, whereas back in the day, a lot more cars had like a flat dashboard that just faced you. Everything from a Porsche 911 to, you know, a Mini. This kind of harkens back to that. It's got that more upright, flattened dashboard that's really front facing against you. And I like it. It's it's retro. It's got that old money kind of traditional Jagman kind of vibe to it, where you think of a Jag and this is what you think of. Most people, when they think Jaguar, think XJ. But that leads nicely into one of the things which is great about this car, and that is it looks retro, but underneath, it's the exact opposite. In fact, Jaguar made it far more advanced, and there are a number of huge advantages on this car compared to the previous XJ from the 90s, and one is the weight. Now, they use aluminium bodies on these, and of course they do with the XKs as well, which likewise made a massive difference to the weight of that car. And if you compare this one to the 90s, it really is worlds apart. That was like a 2.2, 2.3 ton car. This one weighs 1.6. It's literally like six or 700 kilos lighter, which is a colossal difference. That's almost like cutting an aerial atom out of the 90s car to end up with this one. But it's not just aluminium. In fact, the seat supports and some of the subframe for the interior are actually made of magnesium, which is even lighter and stronger again than aluminium. Now, in terms of crash repairs, of course, aluminium can be a little bit more expensive, but Jaguar engineered the front end to be capable of taking frontal impacts without too much repair cost, up to about 10 miles an hour. So in terms of driving it around a car park, you don't have to worry too much. Of course, if you have to replace an entire panel on any car, it's going to be fairly expensive. Aluminium, a little bit more so, so try and avoid dinging it up too much. In terms of its fuel economy compared to the older car, compared to potentially the newer one, well, of course, the newer one has more of an advantage from the purely engine technology side of things. And again, I'll talk about that in its own review. Compared to the 90s, though, well, it's definitely better again. Jags have never been really aiming to have the best economy around, but as I've said before, a car that can achieve luxury and or performance and still get great economy impresses me even more. And in terms of what you can expect from one of these, you can get about 17 to the gallon around town, about 36 on the highway for a combined cycle of about 26 to the gallon. And considering the look, the class, the luxury, the comfort, etc., even the sound it makes is lovely, that's pretty good. I mean, overall, I could have easily guessed that this was more like a 4 or 5 litre V8 from the sound of it, because it sounds really nice. I will say that the lower end acceleration feels a little bit sluggish, but again, that's partially due to the fact that I mostly review top-of-the-range performance cars, whereas this one isn't. This is more like the low mid-end of the XJ Spectrum. Moving back to the practicality and the comfort side of things, I want to touch on the interior just once more because another thing that I loved about this particular one, and of course it will depend on the spec that you go for, is the choice of colours. Of course I love black Jaguars, I bought one myself, but the red leather looks stunning inside the car, it really contrasts with the leather on the dash, and of course the wood, which is very dark as well, but it looks great. Stuff like the steering wheel I've already mentioned, I love the chunky feel that it has. It feels like you're piloting a proper big luxury Jaguar, but crucially, and this brings me to the second thing that really struck me about the car after the headroom, and immediately made me realize that I like this one more than the new car, is the handling. The handling on this car, even though this is not the R model, is fantastic. It's so good through corners, it's a pleasure to work with. It feels so light on its feet. And that's because it is. <laughs> this weighs 50 kilos less than my XKR does. 
Now for a big four-door Jag with full leather etc, that's remarkable. And another reason why it feels so good through corners but also so comfortable is because it has self-actuating air suspension. Self-leveling, you don't have to do anything from the interior to adjust it. Self-leveling as I said, self-dampening through corners and it works like a charm. It feels so comfortable. In fact, I've driven newer luxury cars than this which felt less impressive to be honest. It's probably one of the more comfortable cars that I've driven, which you would kind of expect and want from an XJ, so it's nice to know that it does deliver that. One of the things that I like as well about this car is that it almost seamlessly blends a combination of old money and new money. And that's something which I'm going to touch on in the newer XJ review as well. But with this one, I think it kind of tips the balance even better than that car does because it looks and has the vibe of that old money, you know, gentleman's Jaguar, but it has the advanced technology, the smarter tech inside in terms of suspension, etc., the better fuel economy, the better handling of a newer car. And to me, combining those things is never going to be a bad thing. So that brings us back to why are they so cheap? Well, I think there are two reasons. Now, one of these I haven't fully researched when it comes to this car. So as I often say in these reviews, if you are or were an owner of an XJ like this or this generation, even something like the XJR, then of course, slap your story, experiences, warnings, etc. down below in the comments so that those who watch the video can check out those for themselves if they are potentially in the market, of course. But one thing that I do know about the XJR in particular, and I think it probably applies to that one more than this, is that they are susceptible, apparently quite regularly, to having their brake discs warp over time, which makes the steering have quite a nasty judder, especially under braking. And from what I've read and researched in owners' forums and experiences, it seems that the reason for that was mostly because the Brembo parts just didn't really mesh that well with Jaguar's own, so it's a problem that never really goes away in the case of that car, and can result in you having to replace the discs even up to yearly if you drive the car hard enough and regularly enough. Now, as I said, I'm not sure if that applies to this one as well. It might. I suspect this one doesn't have as powerful brakes, potentially even not the same brand of brakes. As I said, I haven't researched that one for the XJ8 specifically, but it wouldn't surprise me if some of those issues would be carried over. A second reason why I believe cars like this pretty much always depreciate quickly is because there's just a certain type of car, which always does. And it tends to be luxury cars, stuff like Range Rovers, Jaguars, Lexus models. They tend to be some of the worst for losing a lot of value very quickly. And it actually doesn't mean that they're necessarily a bad car. And I think one of the reasons why applies to a lot of luxury vehicles that aren't necessarily, you know, something like a supercar. And that is personalization. See, if you buy a car where it's like the classic Ford Model T example, any colour you want as long as it's black, no optional extras, everyone gets the same thing, well, chances are, if it's a good car, it's going to keep its value pretty well, as long as it's not crazy expensive to begin with, because if you want to find one, they're all going to be the same, customers know what they're going to get, both in the new and the used market. If you change that, though, and make it a luxury car with a very high level of personalization with crazy colored interiors, different stitching, different options here and there, well, by definition, no two people are going to have the exact same taste. So by buying a vehicle that is used, that maybe doesn't have that particular wood trim that you like, or this particular stitch pattern, well, of course, it's not going to have the same kind of universal appeal as a car that just has one trim level for everyone. At least that's my theory. And with stuff like luxury cars, that is more often the case. For instance, with this one, not everyone wants red leather seats. Now, in the case of something like a hot hatch, that's not going to be as much of an issue because they're more standardized. In the case of a car like this, it is more of an issue because there's more luxury, more personalization there, and it's not as easy to change something like that retroactively because the parts and the work would cost you more. Now, I could be wrong, but that's what I think. Now, in terms of reliability overall, I hear pretty good things from this generation. And of course, with any luxury car, some of the parts and service could cost more. But another reason why I love Jaguar so much, and this has been confirmed by multiple comments and messages that I've had as well, is that even though they're not necessarily cheap to maintain per se, they are more often than not, in fact, a lot cheaper 
than the rivals are. For example, I believe I had a comment on my XFR review that said that a gentleman had owned an XFR, he'd also had a, I believe it was a Mercedes AMG and a couple of others in the past, and he said that certain parts for that Jaguar were literally like a third of the price of those equivalent parts on the Mercedes. Something like brake discs, for example, were about £300 for the set rather than over a grand. That is one of the huge advantages of a Jaguar, and with this one not even being the top of the line, that's probably going to be accentuated even more, since you don't have those R model components to try and find. I would actually say that this falls into a similar category, funnily enough, to something like the Mercedes R-Class, which I reviewed from Affordable Prestige Cars as well some time ago. And that is, it's a car which, although nowhere near as controversial or oddball as that one, is kind of in a niche in the market wherein it falls into a highly affordable category of car with a huge amount of spec and great ability for the money, but it also falls into that same sector of the market where the kind of budget that those people are on tends to make them a little bit wary of buying something like a Jaguar or a Mercedes in case it does break down. That is something which is not going to change, because that's just where these cars are on the market. From my experience of owning and buying luxury or high-performance cars, I would actually say that something like this is better in terms of you know being a safe bet or a safe purchase than something like a, an Italian equivalent, <coughs> Maserati, for example, because something like that is going to break, something like this might break. And that's a pretty huge difference. With the Jag, it might break here, it might break there, you know, you, you've got a chance with any car. With something Italian or whatever, French for example, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. So the choice is always up to you, and as I like to say, it's a calculated risk. Overall though, that's it for my thoughts on the XJ8, and as I said, I do hope to review the XJR, and when and if I do review one of those, I'll put that link at the top of the screen on the right here as well. But until next time, of course, check out more reviews in the Beards and Cars playlist here on screen, and of course I'll see you next time with another Jag review, most likely in the case of, for instance, that newer XJ. But until next time, I'll see you then, and for now, as always, thanks for watching.